Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Shouse and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department. We've been moving sequentially. We started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you do have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. And a special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Swamp Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBFBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group training are free with no restriction on business location. If you are interested in learning more, please use the link provided to explore what PTACs can offer. Set-Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources sought in solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. Please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce for their NOVA B2G matchmaking conference on Thursday, May 6th for networking, matchmaking, and primes and agencies, education, and an expo. Visit the website on your screen for more details. Federal contracting is a relationship game. Now get in front of your federal human sooner with the exclusive players and layers method from Judy Bratt and Summit Insights. Connect with her on LinkedIn and find out more or visit growfedbiz.com today. If you are interested in selling to the federal government, you may need a contract vehicle. The most popular one is the GSA schedule. Learn more about the requirements, the proposal process, and how this contract vehicle may or may not be the right tool for you. Jennifer Schaus is teaching a series of several classes, as you can see here, with the Virginia PTAC and Mary Washington University. All classes are listed on our website under the events section with the registration link. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information can be found on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series in 2021 this year. We have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. And this is a live webinar series held each month. These will take place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. And we have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and take your live questions about that topic. So for example, our panelists covered team agreements this month. And next month on May 9th or May 14th, our panelists um, will be covering subcontracting. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, um, and other industry professionals and you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershops.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each webinar. 
Okay, now to introduce our speaker, Adam Muniz. Welcome, Adam. We are glad to he have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Hunter, and thanks for the, the introduction. Um, my name is Adam Munitz. I'm a partner at FHH Law Firm based out of Tyson's, where I focus on government contracting and international trade and transactions. Um, I apologize in advance for this very cheesy photo. This was, to be clear, before the pandemic when I still knew how to smile. Um, I'm working on it, but it, it's going to take a little while. Um, but I'm smiling today because we're going to be talking about um, DFARS Part 217. I think it's a really really interesting topic. So um, Hunter, if you could please move to the next slide, we'll go ahead and get started. We have the link here. Um, for those of you that are following along, I encourage you to access the link afterwards. Um, really take a look at part 217. There is no substitute as with any DFARS part, any FAR part with absolutely knowing the, um, the, the subpart or part itself. So I do encourage you all to go ahead and review that um, after the session when it's still fresh and you can catch some more of the, the details that we don't necessarily cover today. Um, I, I'm going to try and go through this relatively quickly. I know everyone's busy um, dialing in during lunch, um, and I think that this can actually be addressed relatively quickly. Um, as Hunter said at the outset, if anyone has questions, please just follow up with me after the webinar. Next slide, please. So here we've, we've identified the, the parts that we're going to be walking through today. Um, there's a lot in part 217. This is what we chose to focus on. This is what we find um, interesting at the firm about these, uh, these types of, of contracting vehicles. Um, what's, what's really fascinating about part 217 is that it addresses unique and, and exigent circumstances um, in which the Department of Defense is really forced to act more like a commercial counterpart than the government. And what we'll see today is that there are various measures it takes to try and reestablish itself as a, as a party with disproportionate um, power, as, as it often does. And so we'll walk through how it does so. Um, we'll walk through um, the nuance to these, to these parts. We'll walk through as well, wherever possible, some, some bidding tips and some advice on how to satisfy the various requirements. But I think that you know the, the Part 217 uh, vehicles really do present some some great opportunities for contractors um, if you can figure out a way to take take part in these uh, in these contract vehicles. Next slide, please. Okay, let's let's start with subpart two seventeen point one. That seems like as good a place as any. Um, we'll talk first about multi year contracts. What's great about multi year contracts is as, as we indicate here, they're not like option contracts. We'll talk about those as well. They really are fixed contracts for you know one to five years. And obviously for, for contractors that can get on those contracts, it's a great opportunity um, because you know going into it that there is a there's a set number of set amount of time there. It's, it's more than one year, um, maybe even five years, and that, that can be a great opportunity for for the company. Um, they are, as indicated, issued under specific congressional authority for specific programs. And here we are already seeing the government is only going to enter into these types of contracts, as we'll discuss further, under specific types of circumstances. Because of the, the risk and expense associated with them, the government is not just going to um, enter into these without, without giving them some serious thought. Um, so again, you know, the difference between these and multiple year contracts is that multi-year contracts provide more than one year's requirement of a product or service without establishing or having to exercise an option for each program year. Um, that's great for the contractor. Um, it's also great for the government um, because under these circumstances, the government wouldn't necessarily want to deal with that level of bureaucracy. We want some certainty in terms of, of when the work is going to be performed. As we note towards the bottom of the slide, um, there are a couple of different types of acquisitions in which multi-year contracts will be used. Those for certain types of services, supplies, military family housing, and electricity from renewable energy um, sources. Let's go to the next slide, please. Let's talk about services. So we've outlined the services that are eligible for these kinds of multi-year contracts. And I'll read through them as I do. Just, just think about these kinds of services. I mean, it makes sense that the government would want to contract for these kinds of services on a multi-year basis. They're unique services. They're not your run-of-the-mill defense services. 
Operation, maintenance, and support of facilities installations. A maintenance or modification of aircraft, ships, other highly complex equipment. Specialized training, um, base services, environmental remediation services. Again, these are not your run-of-the-mill um, services for, for DOD. These are unique kinds of services that absolutely require multi-year effort. Um, you know, when you're supporting the, the maintenance or modification of an, an aircraft, for example, or for ships, it, it's going to make it difficult to get that job done if you're stopping and you're, you're, you're negotiating options and you're, you're trying to arrange all the bureaucracy behind the scenes to make sure those options happen, multi-year contracts make a lot more sense. Um, just to the first note here, as I mentioned before, the government is, is going to take, they're going to take certain steps to try and minimize their risks despite these, despite these vehicles. So the agency is expected to confirm that there will be an ongoing requirement for the services. There has to be a demonstration that the requirement will be ongoing in order for the multi-year contract to be used for, for services. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about supplies now. Multi-year contracts for supplies under subpart 172. Again, multi-year contracts won't just be used for any supplies. Um, as noted at the bottom of the slide, it's for it's for you know weapon systems. Um, it's for parts or components necessary to manufacture a weapon system. You know, there's a highly complex type of effort, and as such, a multi-year contract makes sense. But to go back to the top of the slide. Um, not only must the conditions in FAR 17.105 be satisfied, but also it has to promote the national security of the U.S. And, you know, don't just breeze past that. That's a relatively high standard. Um, this type of contract has to promote the national security of the United States, and that has to be, that has to be demonstrated. Um, and as noted in the third bullet point, the Secretary of Defense must submit a budget request to Congress for full funding of units to be procured through the contract. So there, there are requirements um, that need to be satisfied in order for these multi-year contracts to be used for supplies. Um, they're not necessarily easy to meet for the agency, but they are very necessary and very useful um, for weapon system contracts, for parts and components, um, for, those, uh, for those parts and for those, for those systems. Next slide, please. As I noted, multi-year contracts can also be used for military family housing. Um, not too much to be discussed here, although I would note that um, contracts for military family housing are available for periods only up to four years, so not for five years. And that's a that's a, a bit of a, a bit of a difference to be to be aware of. You most likely see these for supplies and services required for management, maintenance, and operation of military family housing. Next slide, please. As noted before, multi-year contracts can also be used for um, to procure electricity uh, from renewable resources. Um, just please note that those that these contracts can only exceed five years for renewable resources when the head of the contract contracting activity can provide a business case that the proposal is cost effective and it would not be possible to otherwise purchase electricity from the source in an economical manner for a period of five years or less. So again, you see the government through these provisions, trying to minimize its risk, trying to make clear that these types of contracts are not going to be used um, under you know, just any circumstances. And again, you know, the, the timing is different for these, these types of services. Um, they can last up to 10 years, provided that that business case um, is met. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about option contracts, a vehicle that, that all of you are probably more familiar with. Um, unlike multi-year contracts that have a fixed set period in advance, under option contracts, um, the government has the right to elect to purchase additional supplies or services um, and to exercise those, op those options at its discretion. Again, another layer of bureaucracy, not quite as streamlined as the multi-year contract, but they still give the government some flexibility to enter into a longer term arrangement with the contractor. I mentioned surge options here. They're not, you know, too common. You know, we don't see them too often, um, but they do give the government the ability to accelerate the contractor's production rate 
in accordance with a, a plan or schedule that's already been provided by the contractor. So it wouldn't be a, a complete surprise to the contractor. They've already put a surge production plan or delivery schedule in place, um, but it does give the, the government the opportunity to quickly, you know, rapidly accelerate the production. Um, typically, you see these kinds of option contracts um, when the government needs to satisfy foreign military sales requirements or support industrial capabilities. That makes sense. Um, those are those tend to be longer lead efforts, um, particularly foreign military sales requirements. And um, it's, it's always possible there that additional time is going to be required. And as such, an option makes a lot of business sense. Next slide, please. So it's always important to note the differences between the DFARs and the FAR, if there are any. I would just note here that option contracts in the FAR are limited to five years, but under the DFARs, um, multi-year option contracts can last for an initial period of five years and then may be extended for successive periods of up to 10 years. Um, I put the exceptions down below, but again, this, this, this makes sense. This is logical for the DOD contracts. Um, there tend to be longer term efforts. I mean, we we're talking about the kinds of kinds of projects on which DOD works. Um, they take more time. And so it, it's logical that that you would see option periods for up to 10 years, whereas in the FAR for maybe more, you know, more a civilian agency, you don't necessarily need that that period of time. So again, there, there is a key, key difference between um, option contract and the FAR and the DFARs. And again, I would you know, take a look at these, these exceptions um, at your leisure afterwards. Next slide, please. Just keep in mind that um, obviously, you know, option contracts can be great for contractors. They, they do need to um, make sure that they are eligible for these before they get awarded. Um, so when you're bidding on these, as with any contract, make sure that your information is up to date in SAM. Make sure your CMMC certificate is current and meets the, the threshold requirement for the contract. And make sure that the NIST uh, assessment is current. So again, just, just a tip for, for bidders on these. Make sure that these requirements have been satisfied in advance. Next slide, please. This is a different vehicle. It's, it's the exchange of personal property. Um, you know, DOD's policy is noted here is to exchange rather than replace eligible non-excess property whenever it's economical and efficient. It's a practice in which DOD will engage. Um, but there's no obligation to award on an exchange basis. If the lowest evaluated offer, as we indicated here, um, is an offer for the new items without any exchange, the contracting officer can award on that basis and forego the exchange. This is a pretty niche um, contracting vehicle, um, but it, it's, it's one of which contractors should be aware if you do frequent work in, in the DOD sector and in this area, then, then you, you may run across it. Next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about sources of supply because DFAR is 217.73 does impose some, some interesting requirements when it comes to supply contracts. And under the rules that are codified at 217.73, um, contractors have to identify their sources of supply, you know, the, the actual manufacturer, the actual OEM in those contracts for supplies. Um, and the, the government has, has a few goals here. Um, one is to enhance competition um, by knowing who the actual manufacturer is. Um, but it also ensures that it's avoiding the payment of additional costs where there isn't, you know, significant added value. Um, you know, obviously we, we see resellers in this space. Resellers are, are valuable and, and critical component of the DOD supply chain. But the government does want to know who's actually manufacturing um, the widget. It also allows the, the government to, to know in subsequent acquisitions who to contact, and, and they may well do that. Um, when you have to identify the source of supply, um, you generally have to indicate, as noted here at the bottom, the actual manufacturer producer, um, the national stock number, if there is one, the item identification number, and the source of any technical data delivered under the contract. So again, this gives the government the full situational awareness it needs to maybe procure more parts in the future, but also to ensure that it's not overpaying. And what we're seeing again is that the government is trying to, you know, trying to act like a commercial um, counterpart, but also minimize its risk as it does in the rest of the DFAR and the FAR, despite the exigent circumstances. 
Next slide, please. Just note that this um, identification requirement does not apply to contracts that are for commercial items or are valued at or below the, the SAT, the Civil Right Acquisition Threshold. Um, and there are other exceptions that we've, that we've indicated here, um, where such as the contracting officer already has the information, contracts for subsistence, clothing or textiles, or the provision would just simply not be practicable. Next slide, please. Okay, master agreements for repair and alteration of vessels. This is, I think, when, when part DFAR 17, 217 really starts to get interesting, right? Because here you really start to see the DOD grappling with these, these exigent circumstances and starting to act more like a commercial counterpart, um, despite the fact that it's still within this, this rigid contracting regime. Um, so notably, as we indicated here, a master agreement for repair and alteration of vessels is not actually um, a contract. It's more akin to... Um, an instrument of understanding or a memorandum of understanding, a letter of intent. Um, it's negotiated between the contracting activity and, a, and the contractor. Um, and it contains the terms, conditions, but it is not a definitive binding contract. Um, rather, it contemplates separate future contracts or job orders that are going to incorporate by reference um, the various clauses included in the master agreement. So. You know, typically, we see these kinds of, of agreements, which, as, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, are undefinitized contract actions where there's an exigent, exigent need, um, where there's important work that needs to be done, but there's not enough time to put in place a, a, a full binding contract. As you, you, know, you would predict, um, they're used for ship repair work, for job orders to effectuate um, repairs or alterations, um, for job orders for emergency work required in order to save a vessel. Under all these circumstances, it makes sense that the government would want to enter into this type of undefinitized contract action or, or, or UCA. Next slide, please. Much like you know, a memorandum of understanding or letter of intent um, is often the case in, in the commercial sector, which can be you know, canceled by either party, they're, they're less binding. Here, the master agreements can remain in effect until they're canceled by either party. Um, either party can cancel them typically with 30 days written notice. Again, an indication that this is not your standard contracting vehicle. Um, but it does not affect the rights and liabilities under any job order, right? So if a job order has been issued, much like a task order, has been issued against a master agreement for repair and alteration of vessels, um, that job order and the, the obligations and responsibilities it creates um, still very much remain in effect. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about UCAs, about undefinitized contract actions um, more broadly, right? We just talked about one, one example. Um, and as noted before, they are any contract action for which the contract terms, specifications, or price are not agreed upon before performance. Um, so they, again, they remain a more flexible um, understanding, so to speak. What's important to note is that the contracting officer cannot enter into a UCA for foreign military sales um, unless you know there, there are certain um, certain processes that have been in place, and there's there's obvious reason for that, right? I mean, foreign military sales are, to require so much effort. Um, they are such a, an important tool of U.S. diplomacy that to pin those types of efforts that have such strong implications from a foreign policy perspective on an undefinitized flexible agreement just, just doesn't make sense. Um, of course, the head of the contracting activity can waive this requirement if it's, if it's necessary to support, you know, contingency operation or humanitarian, humanitarian or peacekeeping operation. Um, so there's still some flexibility, but in general, they are not used for foreign military sales. When might you expect to see these? Again, um, they're, you know, they're expected for provisioned items orders, for orders under BOAs, letter contracts, where the price has simply not been agreed upon pre-performance. Next slide, please. Now, UCAs are, are, not, um, are not always uh, appropriate, right? And certain types of UCAs are not subject to this subpart. There are certain circumstances which dictate their own types of undefinitized um, contracting vehicles those at or below the, the simplified acquisition threshold. Special access programs obviously need something much more, much more tailored and specialized. 
and then congressionally mandated long lead procurement contracts. Um, in order for the, the, the contracting activity to enter into UCAS, um, the contracting officer must obtain approval from the head of the contracting activity and prior approval is also required for requirements for non-urgent spare parts and support equipment in a UCA and to modify the scope of a UCA when performance has already begun. Next slide, please. Of course, the government's not just going to enter into an undefinitized contract action without there being some sort of ceiling, without there being some sort of control on the cost. And for that reason, the UCA has to contain two important components. The first is a not to exceed price, an NTE price. Um, that is a, a cap past which the contractor cannot perform. And of course, a definitization schedule um, that provides for the definitization by the earlier of either the date that is 180 days after the contractor submits a qualifying proposal or the date on which the amount of funds obligated under the contract action is equal to more than 50% of the not to exceed prices. So again, these are, these are two mechanisms that the government's putting in place to try and minimize its risk despite all of the risk that's accepting um, in the UCA. Two quick bid tips. Um, submission of a qualifying proposal in accordance with the definitization schedule is a material element of the contract that's important to remember. Also, if the contractor does not submit a timely qualifying proposal, the contracting officer can suspend or reduce progress payments under this, provar this FAR provision or take other appropriate actions. So just two things to keep in mind when, when bidding on undefinitized contract actions. Next slide, please. This is another you know, very niche um, contracting vehicle that, that's put in here. I'm not going to say much about it, but it's acquisition of replenishment parts, um, those that are required to ensure safe, dependable, and effective operation of equipment. Um, you know, two circumstances in which you might see this, one is where the government is procuring repairable or consumable parts acquired after the initial provisioning process, um, and then orders for replenishment parts acquired concurrently with the production of the end item. Next slide, please. Now, the DFARS dictates that the, the contracting officer can't just enter into these types of, of contracting vehicles, you know, ad hoc because of the risks, again, that, that, that the government um, assumes. So DFARS 217.75 dictates that the contracting officer shall not award on a sole source basis a contract for any centrally managed replenishment part when the price of the part has increased comparably by 25% or more over the most recent 12 month period. So I think that what we see here is that the DFARS is trying to, trying to limit excess or trying to limit abuse of this, of this provision when it just simply doesn't make sense. Next slide, please. I'd like to address it and again, another niche um, uh, contracting vehicle contracts with provisioning requirements. Um, you know, what is provisioning? It's not a concept we're all familiar with. It's the process of to de determining and acquiring the range and quantity of spare and repair parts and support and test equipment required to operate and maintain an end item for an initial period of service. Um, quick tip in terms of, of dealing with these types of contracts. Um, contractors will be expected in these circumstances to provide provisioning technical documentation which is the data needed for the identification, selection, determination of initial requirements, and cataloging of support items to be acquired through the provisioning process. So what does this include? It, it's such things as provisioning lists, logistics support and analysis summaries, descriptive data, um, drawings, photographs, and also note that contractors will be expected to flow down this requirement in their subcontracts. Next slide, please. Over and above work is an interesting concept. Um, over and above work is, you know, is essentially a, a requirement the, that the contractor identify needed repairs and recommend corrective action during contract performance. So, so what does this mean? This means that the contractor, while performing a contract, is required to notify um, the, the contracting activity if there are additional repairs, if there are corrective actions that need to be performed. This sounds an awful lot like a, a contracting mod, but as we note here, uh, over, above, over and above requests are not outside the scope of the underlying contract. They're within the scope. Um, so 
wherever practicable. Um, they should be negotiated prior to performance, but of course that's not always possible. Again, the onus is on the contractor to bring this up as soon as possible, um, bring up this, this, this work that needs to occur, but it's not outside the scope of the contract. Two quick tips um, for contractors. The clause uh, 7028 requires the contractor and the KO to, uh, to negotiate specific procedures for government administration and contractor performance of over and above work requests. And the contracting officer may issue a blanket work request authorization describing the manner in which individual over and above requests will be administered and setting forth a dollar limitation for all over and above work under the contract. And that makes sense, right? The contracting officer may, may try and, and cap the risk and, and try and forecast how this is going to work and how these requests will be, will be handled um, in advance of, of performing work. Next slide, please. Reverse auctions are, I think, an interesting, interesting vehicle. Um, they essentially allow contractors to bid in a unique, unique way that we don't always see. Notably, though, and understandably, contracting officers are prohibited from using these reverse auctions when they're procuring items that are designated as, you know, PPE as personal protective equipment, or you know, an aviation critical safety item. Um, when the activity advises the contracting officer that the level of quality or failure of the equipment or item could result in combat casualties, right? Obviously, in these circumstances, you don't want there to be, um, you don't want there to be that kind of, of bidding. So, you know, what is a critical safety item? Um, a part, assembly, installation equipment, launch equipment um, for an aircraft or aviation weapon system. Um, if the part, assembly, or equipment contains a characteristic, um, any failure, malfunction, or absence which could cause any of the catastrophes that we referenced here. Again, under these circumstances, it simply is not appropriate to have reverse auctions. Next slide. Um, as we bring this to a close, we've just listed resources um, that are useful. Again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough it's important you know, to, after these webinars to go back to the source material, familiarize yourself with the particular provisions, make sure you're, you're agile with them, you understand um, how they work, um, and these are these are the links you can do, you can use to to reference and understand part 217. Um, that really, next uh, last slide please, um, that really wraps up my, my uh, presentation. I'd like to thank in closing uh, my associate Megan Pastor for helping put these slides together. She did a fantastic job as usual. It was invaluable. Um, I hope that you found uh, part 217 as, as interesting as I did. And um, please, by all means, if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to um, email me at the email address listed here. If you'd like to call, you're by, by all means welcome to do so. So I um, hope this finds everyone uh, healthy and enjoying their day and look forward to participating in another uh, webinar soon. Thank you, Adam, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS.